Well, in the interest of time, we can go ahead and get started. Um, I know folks are still, you know, continuing to uh, trickle in and join the conversation. Uh, welcome again. Thank you for joining the webinar uh, focusing on diversifying the technology industry featuring Dr. Allison Scott, CEO of the Caper Foundation. Uh, as you may uh, be able to see, folks are entering and introducing themselves on chat. So please do that as well. Enter your name, organization, location, and any social media links that you would like to uh, include. Uh, again, my name is Maylene Hamto. I'm a practice partner with Diversity Waymaker and executive DEI consultant at WTIA. We are really glad that you're here to the, um, with us today, and we appreciate your engagement and readiness to learn with us. So before we introduce the main presentation, we have a few announcements from myself and Greg Glover, WTIA head of DEI business development. Then we will have have Sonja Sulser, our uh, DEI COE product manager, um, introduce Dr. Allison Scott of KPOR Foundation. So just a few housekeeping items. Um, as you know, this event is offered in a Zoom format, so please feel free to use the chat uh, to share your reflections or reactions to the presentation. And if you have any uh, specific questions you'd like Dr. Scott and Yolanda Chase to address, please post it in the Q&A so we may all um, collect your queries and uh, answer them at the end of, towards the end of the webinar. Uh, and also, uh, toward the end of the discussion, I will post a link to a post-event feedback survey. Uh, please respond. Uh, your feedback is really important to us as we continue to improve our offerings. Uh, I also want to draw your attention to the resources icon uh, or tab um, you know, uh, of the web of the Zoom webinar that we're in to right now. So it's located in the Zoom menu tray. So what we've done is compile uh, downloadable files and web links to helpful and relevant DEI resources. So we invite you to go to the resources tab and click on the links to learn more about KPOR resources and research uh, about diversifying uh, about their work in diversifying the technology industry. There are also tools and resources from the DEI Center of Excellence at WTIA. So for those who are new to the Washington Technology Industry Association, we would like to share um, the mission of our work. Um, the DEI Center of Excellence leads and supports the creation of anti-racist uh, multicultural organizations where equity is deeply rooted and sustained in our workplaces and the communities that we serve. So to recap, the purpose of DEI COE learning opportunities is to educate ourselves and our teams on implicit bias, cultural awareness, and anti-racism in the workplace. We also share best practices on how to effectively recruit, develop, and retain people of color. Uh, in addition, these, uh, these uh, convenings uh, share ideas on how to build a lasting change in behavior among ourselves and our companies with the goal of delivering more equitable outcomes in the workplace. So we know that since 2020, some time has passed since the massive protests to advocate for racial justice that really put DEI front and center of our collective consciousness. So the racial reckoning elevated the importance of focusing on DEI in the corporate realm. Um, and at Washington Technology Industry Association, um, as DEI practitioners and leaders, we're committed to racial equity. We believe that it is our responsibility to keep the momentum going in creating awareness about the mechanisms of uh, racism, um, especially in the workplace, how they manifest in the workplace. So it is important that we continue the conversation and how we can recognize how um, systemic inequities are integrated in hiring and retention decisions, talent and performance management, as well as other crucial decisions that affect uh, people's careers. I would also like to share another event that we are hosting as part of the DEI Thought Leadership Series. So on December 7th, we are presenting a high-level overview of the findings from the DEI Insights Report, which is a mixed method study that uh, we conducted um, in 2022. Uh, we interviewed DEI leaders, HR practitioners, as well as workforce development professionals in the tech industry, uh, because we wanted to find out what they see as opportunities and barriers to advancing racial equity in their organizations. So the report highlights the following themes, 
uh, including leveraging DEI and talent, talent management, leading with cultural transformation, advancing DEI practices through an intersectional lens, and investing in leadership capacity development. I will also share about my dissertation research study. I recently achieved my doctoral degree in leadership and educational equity from the University of Colorado, Denver. And so my dissertation focused on how leaders in STEM organizations are advancing the principles of racial equity by leveraging innovative tactics, navigating institutional dynamics and advocating for people from marginalized communities. So I will just share on chat here the um, DEI, the link to the DEI Insights Report from WTIA. Um, it's also part of the resources tab. So on for this event, after the presentation of research findings, we will engage in a conversation with uh, Chief Diversity Officer Yolanda Chase about impactful solutions for organizational transformation toward equity and inclusion. So before I pass on the mic to my colleague, Greg Glover, we would first like to get an idea about your current understanding of the benefits of diversifying the technology workforce, as well as your experience and observation about how the focus of DEI may have changed uh, for your organization. So we will launch the um, polls now. We have a couple of uh, polling questions for you uh, to answer. Please answer the two questions to the best of your understanding. There's no right or wrong way to respond. So we'll just give you a couple of minutes to review the questions and respond. Then we will close the polls. Okay, thank you so much for uh, taking part in those polling. Um, it seems like we most everyone on the call have already responsi responded. So this gives our speaker um, and Yolanda a quick pulse about your thoughts about the benefits of DEI, as well as any challenges that are present in the industry right now. So we'll just uh, close that screen and I will go ahead and introduce my colleague, Greg Glover, and we share my screen as well. Thank you so much, Maylene. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be. I just wanted to talk a little bit about what I do here. My name is Greg Glover. I'm the head of business development for the WTIA DEI Center of Excellence. And we have a, a, a we have several products and services that we offer. And most importantly, it is Diversity Waymaker suite of products. So you may be asking, what makes Diversity Waymaker different from other DEI programs? In many organizations, DEI initiatives tend to focus on the basis of understanding systemic racism or bias. Diversity Waymaker is a groundbreaking DEI leadership development training that supports a dramatic shift in behavior and mindset, enabling leaders to drive real, tangible DEI outcomes in their organizations. Through a self-reconciliation process of beliefs and personal core values process, Diversity Waymaker fosters a better understanding of the ways our personal values may hinder or fuel DEI innovation. As I mentioned, we have a suite of offerings. Diversity, we have Diversity Waymaker workshops and coaching, our workshops are in-person or virtual, and our coaching is virtual. We have also uh, happy to announce that we just launched Diversity Waymaker 100% Asynchronous 8-Week Online Course, and this is powered by DeVry. This also includes a mentoring component where leaders can connect with DEI subject matter experts, get feedback on course submissions, 
and participate in mentor moderated discussions that will they will connect with mentors in real time via an online messaging system. After only eight weeks, imagine the positive impact you can make on your organization as the, the virtues of DEI begin to permeate your culture. Also, our suite of offerings guide executives and managers to process along to a process along a values-based DEI journey, enabling them to develop the self-awareness necessary and mindset shifts necessary to effectively transform work environments that are sometimes inhospitable to equity and inclusiveness, and all too common issue that contributes to the diverse tech talent gap. Potential outcomes may include the mobilization of a diverse tech talent workforce of your organization, higher employee engagement, satisfaction, and retention, the reduction of turnover or talent acquisition costs, improved integration and partnership among teams, the increased likelihood of a company outperforming other companies that do not have the same level of diversity, and also at the creation and enhancing of a thriving and and inclusive culture. Now envision the long-term lasting effects of a thriving diverse workforce. It's faster speed of innovation, higher productivity, improved creativity, and a culture where teams made up of individuals from a variety of backgrounds are inspired to collaborate and all the employees feel included, seen, and valued. I will put my information in the chat. I would love to to meet with you and explore how our Diversity Waymaker can help create a more inclusive and equitable workplace environment for your organization. Our team is dedicated to providing tailored solutions to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we believe that by working together, we can make a significant impact. During our meeting, we can discuss your specific needs and goals, and I'm confident that together we can develop a plan that will lead to positive changes within your company. I'll put my information in the chat and let's schedule a meeting at your earliest convenience to embark upon this journey towards a more diverse and inclusive future. And with that, I'd like to bring up my colleague, Sonja Sosa, who is our senior product manager. Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Sonja Sosa, and I'm the senior product manager at the Center of Excellence here. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Allison Scott. Dr. Scott is the Chief Executive Officer of the Kapoor Foundation. Prior to leading research at Kapoor, Dr. Scott was the program leader for the National Institute of Health, enhancing the diversity of the NIH-funded workforce program. Dr. Scott was previously the Director of Research and Evaluation at the Level Playing Field Institute, overseeing a research agenda examining barriers to pursuit and completion of degrees and employment in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics among underrepresented populations. Her research examined the influence of perceived barriers and stereotypes in the sciences, the double bind facing women of color, and the effectiveness of research-based interventions in improving STEM outcomes for underrepresented groups. She has led the longitudinal evaluation of the Level Playing Fields Pre-College STEM Intervention Program and is the principal investigator for a National Science Foundation grant to increase access, success, and preparation in computer science for underrepresented students in California. In just two years, this project has demonstrated significant increases in the numbers of underrepresented students of color and girls completing computer science courses, taking the AP computer science exam and intending to major in computer science in college. Well done, Dr. Scott. Dr. Scott holds a PhD in, ed in education with a specialization in psychology from the University of California, Berkeley, and a bachelor's degree in, psycholo in psych psychology from Hampton University. Welcome, Dr. Scott, and thank you so much for joining us today.
Dr. Scott, I think you're on, on mute. Thank you, got it. <laughs> thank you so much for the introduction, Sanja, and thank you all for joining us today. I really appreciate the invitation to come and speak to you all a little bit about our work at the KPOR Foundation. And I'm gonna share my slides here. There we are. Um, so good morning. I'm joining uh, from Oakland today, Oakland, California, uh, which is Ohlone territory. This is a picture of our building in downtown Oakland. Um, and just also wanted to acknowledge that it is a Native American History Month, um, Heritage Month, I'm sorry. Um, and also that it's, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that it's a challenging time for many. Um, and I, I urge us all to kind of reflect on our shared humanity and um, support all struggles for freedom and justice. So I'm excited to talk to you all today. Um, I have a, a little agenda. Um, so I wanted to share a little bit about uh, the foundation and what we do. Um, get, taking a look at the data, the landscape of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in the tech space. Um, talking about the trends that we're seeing. There were some of the, the references in the polls that you all took. The broader context within which our, our collective work is situated. Um, talk a little bit about some of our initiatives and accomplishments at the foundation. Uh, but most importantly, I think the reflections, what we've learned from uh, doing work in the space and then our bets and our ideas for how to move forward in the future. So our mission at the KPOR Foundation is to create a more equitable uh, technology ecosystem that addresses longstanding racial inequality, that creates economic opportunity, that tackles critical societal issues and reflects the power and perspectives of communities of color. And over time we've evolved, we've evolved um, that mission to have some very specific core principles. So um, <clears throat> we have four that we think are really important to um, how we um, organize ourselves and how we um, execute our work. So we operate at the intersection of racial justice and technology. We aim to change systems of inequality. Uh, we believe that th uh, the advancement of research-driven practices, policies, and programs can transform opportunities and outcomes for communities of color. And uh, we believe in collective impact um, and building inclusive tech ecosystems requires partnership and collaboration with aligned organizations. So you'll hear that reflected as I talk a little bit about our work. Um, and about... Um, Five years ago, maybe a little bit more than that now, uh, we published something called the Leaky Tech Pipeline Framework, which is still available on our website if you want to check it out. Um, the intention of this framework was to help um, articulate the ways in which we should all in the tech space think about the lack of diversity in tech. Um, and what it clearly articulates is that it's not just a, um, there aren't just uh, one, there's not just one point in the pipeline um, that causes folks to drop out, but that there are biases and barriers um, from pre-K-12 to higher education, to the workforce, all the way to entrepreneurship. And that it's really this, um, we have to look at the entire ecosystem um, and try to change um, and intercept it and provide interventions at each stage of the, um, of the ecosystem and of the pipeline. So this is how we orient um, our work around the, this framework as well. Um, so I won't go into too much detail, but just wanted to share with you all Again, the framework looks at um, biases and barriers across the pipeline. So we actually organize ourselves across those four stages of the pipeline. Um, we focus on four focus areas. So CS education equity, inclusive pathways to tech jobs, tech workforce diversity, and investing in entrepreneurs and venture capitalists. Um, and our strategies are um, we conduct research. We partner with organizations by providing strategic grants. Um, and other opportunities for collaboration. Um, and we are very interested in policy advocacy as well. And just one last thing about um, how we organize our work. Um, so we are have, as of the last two years, um, really doubled down on the ecosystem approach. Um, so across the four focus areas, we are intentional about driving change um, in three different regions that we prioritized. Um, Oakland, California, Detroit, Michigan, and Atlanta, Georgia are our three um, priority cities. And again, we're working across K-12, post-secondary, the workforce, and entrepreneurship um, to try to work in, in, um, in a collective impact model with other organizations as well. So as a researcher, um, and my, my team always knows this, as a researcher, I love to start with 
uh, the data and what the data tells us about um, diversity in the tech sector. So this might be very familiar to some of you, uh, but I think it helps to give us a grounding in terms of the conversation about the work that we're doing and why it's so important. So starting um, very early on in K-12 education, uh, we know and we've been tracking this data for some time um, that access to foundational CS courses are inequitably distributed by students' geography. Um, this is the most recent data that it actually just came out maybe a, a week ago. Um, so um, currently only 57.5% of high schools um, offer computer science across the country. And you can see from the map, um, it's a little bit small, but you can see from the map that there are there's quite a variation um, in terms of access, just basic access to computer science courses across the country. And we know that disparities persist by race, ethnicity, gender, and income level. Um, here in California, we did a study about um, 10 years ago that looked at the disparities in access to computer science education. Um, and we are still uh, working to try to address those disparities. So Black, Latinx, uh, Native American, um, students as well as girls um, and low-income students are all uh, underrepresented in computer science courses. And as you'll see throughout the pipeline, that then impacts their um, opportunities to pursue post-secondary um, majors in CS or related fields um, and, and entering into the tech pipeline. And then when we look at the tech workforce, we've also been tracking this on the research side for several years. Um, Underrepresentation by race and gender remains profound in the tech sector and among the largest tech companies. Um, so, according to CompTIA's latest data, um, we still see, see significant underrepresentation for Black, Latinx, uh, and women across um, all of all tech occupations. Um, and on the right, this is very small, so apologies if you can't can't read that. Um, <clears throat> we tracked across all of the tech largest tech companies. We looked at their EEO one reports. Um, and and uh, looked at the um, increase or lack thereof of black talent. Um, and that's the red line. So you'll see very minimal progress across the largest tech companies and significant underrepresentation. And that's from our uh, black tech ecosystem report that's also available on our website. Um, I think I skipped one. Okay. Um, and this is our most recent report. Uh, we just came out with this report last month on the state of diversity in the native tech ecosystem. Um, so we know that investment capital deployed to uh, Black entrepreneurs was only about has only been has been hovering at about one percent for many years. Um, one percent of about two hundred billion dollars that's invested in venture capital each year. Um, and investment deployed to Native and Latinx entrepreneurs is similarly abysmal. So just 1.5% uh, of all venture capital was deployed to Latina, Latine or Latinx entrepreneurs. And just 0 0.02 uh, was deployed to um, American Indian, Alaska Native, uh, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander entrepreneurs. So all of that data provides us some context, right? Um, and so when we look at that data, um, the main things that stick out for us are the impact that these disparities have on marginalized communities in particular, on the tech sector more broadly, and on our entire society. Um, so a couple things that just wanted to highlight from this slide. Um, <clears throat> the, the first um, article around um, rising inequality. So um, this has been a debate for a while, but I think for folks that live in, especially that live in cities um, that have a significant tech presence, um, we've seen things on the ground um, in terms of, you know, rising costs, inequality, uh, gentrification, et cetera. Um, we're starting to see that on a more national scale. So um, more economists pin blame on tech for rising inequality. We know inequality is rising. Um, in terms of who's creating the products and the implications of these products. Um, in the middle, um, many of you have probably seen the, the um, Coded Bias documentary by Joy, Dr. Joy Bulamwini, um, who identified um, significant biases in facial recognition software that particularly impacts Black, um, Black individuals and misidentifies them, which then impacts things like being wrongfully accused of committing crimes that we've seen take over some of the headlines recently. Um, and just the um, the uh, 
potential harms of algorithms and also of um, of social media platforms, um, which is a whole other whole other topic. So our reflections on the current landscape, um, who is creating the leading technology? So when we look at the data around who's represented in the workforce, um, we have a good sense of who's creating these technologies and what are their experiences and backgrounds? So not just their identities, but what experiences have they had over the course of their lives? What things have they had access to or not had access to? Um, what uh, educational backgrounds have they had? Um, and what blind spots might they have? Um, and then who benefits from technology's creation? Um, and in particular, I think uh, one thing that's very resonant for me is as we think about venture capital investment, we think about who deploys capital. So who's investing in startup companies that then benefits when these companies become uh, wildly successful um, and who's not even a part of that entire economy. Um, who's harmed or overlooked by technology products um, or their implications, and then who will be prepared to develop and deploy future tech innovations and who will be left behind. So altogether, we kind of wrap this up as, and say, from our perspective, a diverse representation in the tech sector is critical in the design deployment of technologies and decision making about their use and their impact on communities. So next, I wanted to talk a little bit about the recent trends, which I think um, are top of mind for many, definitely top of mind for us. Um, and um, many of you have probably been in this space for longer than I have, uh, but I can reflect on my about 10 years with the organization um, and just what I've seen in terms of some of the recent trends um, in, in the technology space. Um, so I'm not sure how many folks remember this, but this was uh, right around the time that I, I um, got deep into this work. Um, there was a push for data transparency in tech. So um, Jesse Jackson was calling out Silicon Valley about their empty promises on diversity. Um, investigative journalists, uh, you know, were suing for to try to understand Silicon Valley's diversity data. Prior to this, none of that information was public, so I wouldn't have been able to show you the data that you just saw on uh, the top tech companies and their um, representation, the representation of their workforce. So this is about 2018, 2019. Um, then we had 2020. Uh, oh, wait, let me back up, actually. Um, this And again, this is my like reflection and retelling of what happened, but I'm sure I'm missing a lot of key details. Um, what happened, what I saw happen after the push for transparency in tech uh, was the release of EO1 um, reports from all of the top tech companies. And then uh, right alongside that was, okay, we're releasing our data and we know the data looks terrible. So now we have to start to try to implement some DEIB practices. So this was a trend that led to um, the hiring of diversity and inclusion um, professionals, as well as different di diversity and inclusion initiatives within companies. And then 2020 hit, uh, uh, June of 2020 after George Floyd's murder, um, we saw a significant um, outpouring of support from corporate America and tech in particular, um, with very specific and large commitments to addressing racial equity. Um, this is the this is some sub oops sorry this is some summary data from McKinsey um, that showed about 340 billion was committed from and this is not just in tech but across corporate America um, to uh, fighting racial injustice. Uh, their subsequent report actually has been trying to track down where those commitments went, and that's a whole other topic. Um, but there was a significant amount of energy attention um, given to uh, racial equity in tech around this time. Um, then we also had the 2020 election um, and a real, from our perspective, a real focus on maybe some of the harms of technology and some of the harms of social media, some of the harms of algorithms, how they could be used in uh, ways that were not necessarily beneficial to, uh, to our democracy or to communities of color. Um, so we saw an increase in uh, mis and disinformation. Uh, we saw significant polarization that wasn't just due to social media algorithms, but uh, was definitely amplified uh, by those algorithms. Um, and, uh, we saw the ways in which um, social media algorithms were um, were uh, radicalizing folks as well. 
then we entered this space, which was, um, was that maybe early 20, 2022 um, of tech layoffs. So again, we're coming from a huge commitment around racial equity. We're um, committing resources. We're hiring folks to now um, folks being laid off uh, from tech companies. So um, almost 250,000 employees have been laid off across 1,100 tech companies. This website tracks them all in case you're interested. Um, and what folks were starting to notice, the trends around um, who was getting laid off was that it was really impacting, I mean, it was impacting lots of folks, obviously from 250,000 employees, uh, but was really impacting diversity and inclusion teams and diversity and inclusion efforts within tech companies. So these were some of the, um, the uh, um, folks that were first to be laid off. And that leads us to um, 2023. Um, so, so much has happened. Um, this is our current context. This is the stuff that keeps us up at night. I know we'll spend a little bit more time talking in detail about what we're doing. Um, so we had the affirmative action ruling um, ending race conscious admissions. Um, we then very quickly saw how that was going to impact corporate America. Um, everything from uh, lawsuits um, filed against companies to um, Fearless Fund, who I'm not sure if folks are familiar with, um, which is a program that gives $50,000 grants to Black women founders who are very underrepresented in the entrepreneurship space. Uh, they were sued for uh, racial bias. Um, so a very chill, like a significant chilling effect on diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging in addition, in corporate America, in addition to what was happening in schools and in education, um, anti-LGBTQ bills, um, the um, legislation across what 40, since 2021, across 44 different states that limit the teaching of critical race theory or discussions of racism and sexism, um, and also banning African-American studies classes from Florida high schools. So in sum, um, this is kind of the current context that we find ourselves in as we are all working um, to address the significant underrepresentation that you saw in the data and um, and try to keep our focus on why this is so significant and how it's impacting um, particularly marginalized communities. On top of that, uh, December, almost a year out of the launch of ChatGPT, um, we have this new frontier of artificial intelligence that I am sure all of you have in your roles um, been trying to reckon with. Um, we're reading something new every day about both the new technologies that are coming out as well as potential harms and challenges with those technologies. So uh, one quote that I like to, um, and this was back from 2018, um, AI is going to change the world more than anything in the history of mankind, more than electricity. So I know people fall all across the spectrum of this is going to change absolutely everything we do to like, this is way overhyped um, and everything in between. Uh, but what we are most interested and in, concerned with is ensuring that we have the proper guardrails um, to ensure that this very powerful, very accessible technology can be used in ways that are not furthering harm against uh, particularly marginalized communities. So I'm going to talk for just a few more minutes about our um, what we are doing. So again, this is the data and the, the context that we find ourselves in in terms of uh, underrepresentation in the tech space um, and the current um, contextual factors that we are working within. Um, so our particular work, as I mentioned before, um, one of our key pillars, and this is, again, I'm biased as a researcher, uh, one of our key pillars is to publish research, to constantly talk about what the state of diversity and inclusion is, what the challenges are that we're seeing, and to try to clearly articulate um, recommendations to address those barriers. So as I mentioned, we just released the State of uh, Diversity, the Native Tech Ecosystem Report, um, which has a, a ton of data, um, which is usually not... Um, uh, easily accessible um, or overlooked, however you choose to, to describe it. Um, but we're very happy to have that data be a critical part of our conversation on diversity in tech. 
one of my um, passion projects, um, I, I shouldn't say that I have a favorite because I, I focus on all areas, but one of my passion passion areas is K-12 computer science education. Um, as you heard from my uh, intro, thank you, Sonja, again. Um, I've been working on expanding uh, excess and equity in K-12 computer science for about a decade now. Uh, what we're doing through the foundation is we are conducting and funding research on the topic. Uh, we're supporting state policy advocacy. So I co-lead the CS for California uh, coalition that's working on um, state level policy. Um, and we also have a culturally responsive computer science framework that we are implementing through uh, professional development, partnership with key districts, curriculum and resources. So we're trying to tackle again, back to our core principles, we're trying to tackle the whole system of education and computer science education. Um, and, and working really hard um, to ensure access and equity. So I wanted to share just a few pictures of some of our work um, on the top right. Um, this is a, our newest initiative that we just launched called CS for Detroit. Uh, we're working across stakeholders in the city, um, including the school district and a bunch of amazing partners to expand um, access to computer science in Detroit. Um, we also are working on a project with the American Indian Science and Engineering Society called Seeding Innovation, uh, which is working to expand access to computer science, um, specifically for Native students. Um, and then we are also, uh, this picture on the left, on the upper left, um, is an example of some of the PD that we lead. Um, so a colleague of mine who led some some PD with Oakland Unified uh, teachers on tech ethics and justice. So they're taking concepts like some of the data that we shared, um, some of the questions that we're asking about technology, and this is not necessarily computer science, but they're just expanding, um, making these, these concepts visible to young people. And then, as I mentioned, also uh, supporting um, state-level policy through CS for California. In the post-secondary pathway space, uh, we are very clear that um, both traditional and non-traditional pathways to tech jobs are critical. Um, so we have been working for a few years on um, maintaining a constant um, analysis and understanding of the talent development and training programs uh, that are available nationwide. So this includes everything from boot camps to apprenticeship programs, internship programs, um, and really looking to, to see which of those are uh, most effective and are um, having, uh, having the most impact. Um, we also published an equitable apprenticeship toolkit. So we we're trying to encourage uh, tech companies of all sizes to um, to adopt uh, or to develop apprenticeship programs where you can, uh, which is a different model for obviously for training uh, folks to um, enter into, into the workforce. And these are just some examples of some of the programs that we funded most recently um, in power, which is working on cybersecurity for women of color, cybersecurity training for women, women of color, Career Karma, Code Path, and the National Skills Coalition, uh, which are all working on various versions of, of training folks, um, training adults in, um, in emerging technology areas. On our tech workplace initiatives, we're really excited. We actually did a pivot, and I'll talk about this in terms of our reflections. We did a pivot away from working with big tech companies um, to focusing on startups. So the thesis here is if we can bake in diversity and inclusion uh, from the earliest stages, um, that hopefully uh, these companies as they grow will continue to, um, to prioritize diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, so we have a DEIB for startups course. Um, if anyone's interested in, in sharing with their, um, their communities, please do. Um, these are trainings are underway. Um, again, we have three different versions. We have a one hour, a two hour, um, and a, a more advanced version. Um, and our colleague, Cynthia Overton is leading this work. And she's had, she just kicked off the first one uh, last month um, and has had some great reflections from founders. So we're really excited about this work. And on the venture capital and entrepreneurship side, um, K4 Capital is our sister organization. They are a, an investment firm founded in 2011. Um, they've invested about $300 million in over 200 companies um, at the seed and pre-seed stage. And the core, um, the core investment thesis of K4 Capital is that the companies have to close gaps of access and or opportunity for low-income communities and communities of color. 
Um, and uh, they have also implemented their own diversity, equity, inclusion practices, including a founder's commitment. So before getting a check or an investment, um, the founders have to commit to um, uh, some principles around diversity and inclusion. And then they've also um, taken out the uh, very biased practice of warm intros um, to so that anybody has access to the website, can submit an idea, um, and it'll be reviewed by the investment team. And most recently, we're super proud of Brian and Ulili. Um, they just raised, not just, it's been a little while now, uh, they, they raised their third fund, um, $126 million, which puts them as, um, I believe, I'm not sure exactly if they're the highest, uh, if, if they've raised the most as Black fund managers raise the most amount of money, but um, a significant amount of money to invest in early stage startups that close gaps of access. Um, and they are currently um, investing in companies. So if you know of any companies, send them our way. And then on the foundation side, we also invest from the foundation's endowment. <clears throat> we specifically invest in funds. So we're investing in um, funds that then invest in entrepreneurs. And many of these funds have um, fund managers that are uh, women, folks of color, um, et cetera. Um, and we think that that's a key strategy that aligns with the foundation's work. Um, we also do strategic grant making for entrepreneurship support organizations, and we operate a summer fellows program to try to get more folks from diverse backgrounds into the investing, the tech investing space. And I believe this is the last slide on our work. Um, really excited about this. We launched our equitable tech policy initiative about a year ago. Um, where we were trying, we were calling out nine uh, tech policy areas. So what we saw was that there was a lot of work happening. We can change policies and practices within companies, but we also need um, additional accountability mechanisms. And so we've identified nine different policy areas um, around expanding access to tech pathways, around promoting tech accountability, and increasing tech infrastructure and innovation investments. Um, and we, through our tech policy initiatives, we've um, supported many organizations that are doing amazing work, including um, some of the women on the right, Timnit Gibru, uh, Sophia Noble, and Joy Bulamwini, who are uh, pioneers in the space of um, AI and AI bias. Um, and we are, I should have added another piece that we are now um, heavily involved in all of the conversations taking place in DC around uh, AI accountability. Okay, that was a lot. Um, so from our work, I'd love to just spend a minute uh, talking about my own reflections, right? So this is a, we've been at this for many years. The problem is um, multifaceted. Um, there are lots of challenges in the space, um, but wanted to talk a, a, for a few minutes about our reflections. So the first is um, that we have to continuously evolve our attempts to make the case for DEI. Um, and um, there's a lot to say here, but I think as the context change, I think our messaging also has to change about why DEI is so important. Uh, one of the things that our founder, that Frida Kate Borklein always said was, you know, there was all the data around um, how diverse teams outper outperform um, non-diverse teams and how diversity was good for the bottom line. But then you look at the, the non-diverse tech companies that were actually doing very well financially. So just thinking about like our messaging around making the case. Um, again, why we're doing the policy work is we need greater accountability and regulatory mechanisms. So once the data started to be released, um, journalists, I think we're holding tech companies accountable. So each year they would publish a story about like, you know, has Google made any progress on, on their diversity numbers? But there aren't any external accountability uh, regulatory mechanisms, at least from our perspective. There aren't many. Um, and so we need greater accountability there. Um, talent recruitment and acquisition is changing. You all might be seeing this as well, where I, I believe that younger employees are looking for more diverse environments and more meaningful work. So they're asking different questions of their employers. And I think that's a really important consideration in terms of back to the first point, how we make the case for DEI. Um, and then 
the main reflection I think is that our greatest opportunity is the talent that we have underdeveloped. So just thinking about all of the young people who have never had a chance to take a computer science course, who don't even know, you know, what the possibilities potentially are for careers um, and all the way through to who have we not invested in? What products have we not even considered? What products do we not have because we haven't invested in entrepreneurs from diverse backgrounds? And Maylin, do I have like one more minute? Uh, yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay, cool. Um, so last slide. So our bets for the future. Um, so wanted to reference this uh, op-ed that we just most, most recently published about how tech can move beyond empty promises to advance DEI. Um, you'll see a lot of the same concepts that I mentioned earlier. This was our Frida and I's attempt to try to really encapsulate like the moment that we're in and what we can possibly do um, to advance DEI. Um, so feel free to check that out. I can also drop in the, the link to that article. So our bets for the future, and again, we're going into our strategic planning. So these are the things that we're thinking heavily about. Uh, one, talent development. As I mentioned, very, we're very passionate about this piece. How do we double down on developing the, the tech talent pipeline from K-12 um, and post-secondary um, education? all the way to alternative pathways for adults to access um, the, the skills needed to, um, to access tech jobs. Um, on hiring, which is where you all uh, come in uh, significantly, I think we can all, you know, we think about like what our locus of control, um, you know, we, we don't have control of some things, but we do have power and control in some areas. So I think I'm really focusing on building robust hiring practices um, that expand our recruitment pools. We look differently at how we hire, where we recruit from, how we identify talent um, to things like skill-based hiring and apprenticeships. Like how do we ensure that we get the right skills for the right job and not just go by pedigree, which we know is inherently biased. Um, that will lead to, sorry about the typo, the hiring of more diverse candidates. Um, the third, as I mentioned about our DIB course, um, solidify like uh, policies and practices early in the life cycle of companies, and also how, do, how can we get um, investors to start thinking about DEI in a different way um, so that investors are also looking for uh, companies that are thinking about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then four, um, which is my, my, newest, um, my newest soapbox, uh, is policy. So how do we expand regulation and accountability mechanisms through both public policy, so everything from like the president's recent executive order on artificial intelligence, all the way down to corporate governance, um, and what is the role of boards and shareholders and investors in holding companies, uh, keeping companies accountable to their diversity and inclusion goals. Um, those are our bets. So thank you so much for, for listening to our summary. I really um, look forward to the, a deeper conversation um, and feel free to check out our work at k4center.org. Thank you so much, Dr. Scott, for your presentation and highlighting the journey of uh, KPOR Foundation and really centering research, right? And also providing, uh, you know, strategies and tactics uh, for tech ecosystems to understand trends and also work uh, on diversifying um, the, the workforce. Also, the timeline of change was really great to reflect upon as a DEI practitioner, um, as also we we continue to work on the ch uh, addressing the current challenges that we, we've, we're seeing now. Um, as we, as you noted, addressing significant underrepresentation of Black, Indigenous, Latinx tech talent um, while also dealing with sort of the anti-DEI sentiments that we are seeing in the greater um, society. So also great to hear about the innovative programs uh, focused on youth, uh, training for startup leaders, and also engaging women uh, and um, entrepreneur and uh, investors of color in grant making strategies, et cetera, for entrepreneurs of color. And um, I just wanted to mention to our to our audience. Um, if you have specific questions for Dr. Scott, please drop them in Q&A and we will get to them uh, shortly. Uh, and at this time, I want to introduce uh, our Chief Diversity Officer, Yolanda Chase, uh, who will now engage in a fireside okay. change. Yeah, with Dr. Scott. And so um, Yolanda Chase has been uh, the chief, has served as the chief diversity officer for WTIA uh, since uh, December 2020. Uh, but her commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion goes beyond doing a job. It's not only her devotion, but she believes it is also 
her work um, as well as the calling on her life. And so Yolanda has um, been honored as a finalist in the Women Tech Global Awards in recognition of her strategic efforts in advancing DEI. She uh, is a renowned uh, human resource leader and brings more than uh, 30 plus years of people, culture, and organizational development experience to um, her leadership here at WTIA and also of Diversity Waymaker, which is um, the innovative product that she has led um, for the service of uh, the tech companies as well. So her leadership has made lasting difference in various types of organizations, including global Fortune 100 companies, mission-based nonprofits, governmental um, agencies, and industries such as manufacturing, financial, healthcare, and technology sectors. And so for at the risk of uh, embarrassing her more, <laughs> uh, thank you, Yolanda, for, um, you know, always being our brave and courageous leader in this work. Thank you. <laughs> always and brave and courageous in my hairstyles too as well. So yeah. Love <laughs> it. I think the last time people saw me, it was different and, it's, it, you know, it changes on the, you know, on the promotional um, information as well. Indeed. Well done. Well done, Dr. Scott. Um, all of the work that is being done by, uh, by Kapoor from, you know, policy advocacy to programs to philanthropic uh, contributions. You, uh, every, all the work that you're doing is just so phenomenal. And we are in extreme gratitude to have you here today um, sharing those insights uh, with us. So with that, let's kick it open uh, so that we can talk a little bit about, um, get a deeper look at you. Uh, we'd like to learn more about you and also, you know, kind of what drives you in this work and some of the challenges that you see, because I think collectively, as uh, I mean, for me as a DNI practitioner, um, I every day live the challenges of you know, narrative shift and the impact inside large organizations that have embedded systems of inequity, um, you know, uh, social justice, racial justice, all of those. I mean, we, we wake up in the morning doing it. We can't take the skin off. So we wake up every morning doing it and we go to bed every night and often we dream about it, right? So it, it's never really gone um, from us. And so with you leading Kapoor over the last few years, what has been the most fulfilling part for you? Sure. Well, again, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm, I'm so excited to have this conversation with you, Yolanda. Yeah. I think um, two things, just like reflecting. I think the challenges are really hard, as you mentioned, and we, you know, we're focused on them day in and day out. But I think taking time to like celebrate the small or large wins has been um, really, it's really rewarding, right? So we're, I'm not like, it's a challenge to not see the entire tech ecosystem um, diversify at a, at a more rapid pace, but you see small wins of, you know, somebody that was hired from an apprenticeship program here in Oakland or a young girl who got exposed to computer science education early on and has then gone on and majored in computer science and has like landed a job at Slack. And so I think those like just celebrating those wins has been a really, a really powerful moment for me. And then also um, something that I'm really, really excited about and really proud of as I like reflect back is um, the, 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 what I call the next generation, the folks that are coming behind us. Right. So like just constantly looking around and saying, wow, this, this movement is expanding. So while we're facing a bunch of headwinds, I think there are some really promising trends around um, the younger generation of folks who are really, really passionate about this work. So that keeps me going as well. Yeah, there. I think the the focus on the next generation of of talent, of policymakers, individuals that are going to make sustainable change, increase change, kind of break the glass ceiling, if you will. Uh, of stalled DNI efforts is super important. We do need to focus on that. And often we get so caught in the moment, right, of what's currently happening and kind of battling the challenges that we forget. And it's good that there are organizations such as Kapoor and others that, that actually help us to remember, hey, there's a whole generation of people coming up that are going to be voters that are going to be mm -hmm. you know, future DEI folks that are you know going to be leaders of organizations and founders of just the most profound and, and um, advanced technology that we really need to focus on them as well and kind of forget to share that stuff that's in our brain, right? And make sure that, that it is in, it adopted and inherited. Um, 
it, with that said, what's been the most challenging? I really want to know. I mean, we, mm -hmm. we say it all the time. It's like, oh, all the work is challenging, right? Yes. But, <laughs> but if I were to poke you in the middle of the night and said, tell me what's most challenging, I want to hear from you what is really most challenging, right? And in and, and kind of leading this work um, and diversifying the tech, the tech industry. Um, I'll share before you answer that question that mm -hmm. um, most often I know I hear narratives from the decision makers around, hey, diversity, equity, inclusion creates more separatism than it does unity. Um, we know that the research doesn't lie, right? We know the science doesn't lie. History doesn't lie, even uh, you know, despite how much uh, reshaping and misinformation is out there around history. Um, but is that the most challenging? What, what do you think, um, as you experience this work, is really the deepest challenge? This is such a good question. And actually, as you were talking, I, I might have even shifted my my perception about the deepest challenge. So I think I'm going to give you two. Okay. Um, one is for, for one for me is like you see the magnitude of the problem, and you see like how how important it is, right? It, it has such profound implications on every person from like the person, the, the woman who was wrongfully accused because of a facial recognition, right. um, identified her and she spent, you know, she was eight months pregnant and spent like, you know, 30 hours in jail, right? That has real implications. And so trying to solve a problem when back to your point, we're, we're still trying to argue why this even matters, right? So I think that's, it's like seeing how important this work is, how it impacts so many people and has pretty significant harms uh for a lot of people um and um the other piece that and this is not just on tech um but this is just my own personal reflection of the space and the challenges that we face is also just um what i find very hard to combat is a is like an assault on truth so thinking like as a researcher i'm like okay well here are facts here's data like we understand how we got here we understand all of these like historical facts um but the assault on facts is really hard to to address because then that impacts like okay you're trying to convince somebody why this matters right if we can't share the same knowledge about fundamental facts it right. becomes very hard to have a conversation and fundamental facts is key, especially in this era of social media, right? Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. The attack on the tr on truth, as you talk about that, that really does have um, when we see kind of the geopolitical shifts, and uh, not just not not just nationally, but geopolitical shifts, right? Where mm -hmm. we're seeing other countries that get involved in also shaping narrative of what is truth and what's not truth. So you've got hundred percent inside social media, so. I don't think that people necessarily understand the the real significance of social media and AI when it comes to shaping truth about mm -hmm. this. So I agree that it's this constant battle of here, let me give you the facts, let me give you the facts, and then somebody else coming and disputing the facts because they saw something on social media. Hundred percent. Get that narrative out, right? So it it really is a, a constant battle. The same with this, you know, idea around. Um, you know, kind of reporting the chilling uh, 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 effects of the anti-woke, right, and anti-DNI movement, where the voices are extremely loud against equity, um, and even becoming louder, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I see that this trend really isn't going away. I, uh, there's a shift in balance and power. There are things that happen. I mean, when we we talk about affirmative action and the civil rights movement, and we can't, we 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 t tend to see. Uh, these kinds of shifts kind of bubble up more when something significant happens, a change in policy or whatever the situation is. Um, in what ways has the Kapoor Foundation really continued um, to work on the commitment despite this kind of anti-woke feeling, you know, that that comes? So how do you keep yourself kind of line of sight knowing that there's so much in the anti-woke and, you know, kind of anti-DE&I um, narrative right now. Absolutely. And, and this is definitely, um, an ongoing challenge and a work in progress, right? I think for all of us. And so acknowledging that, um, I think part of why I wanted to share at least my own version of the history of diversity in tech is, 
is so that we can all kind of be reminded that like these things come in waves, like there are different waves, right? There was this, this peak in 2020 where it felt like everybody was on board with this. And now we're experiencing what many would call a backlash to that focus. Um, and so trying to not get too caught up in the um, the ebbs and flows and really re remain laser focused on what, what the mission is. Um, and so that actually for us, that means like, we are going to continue to be explicitly racial justice focused, right? We're not gonna back off of that commitment. Um, um, there are a few examples So one in the computer science space, like one of the, we produced a framework, uh, we were talking about, again, fundamental facts. We are like systemic racism and inequality in education is kind of the, the foundation for why we see disparities in computer science. That became a very challenging hot button issue because of what you know the contexts are across multiple states. Uh, literal legislation where teachers aren't allowed to say race and equity in classrooms, but we still have, you know, we said we've taken the stance of like, this is what we're going to publish. This is our focus. Um, and we fully understand that there are many, many challenges that folks are facing that have different dynamics, but we think it's important to, again, remain like committed to our focus on racial justice. And uh, that staying the course, right? Um, I think is the biggest challenge and, and every day of my life doing this work, and I'm sure in yours as well, we hear people coming back to us and saying, well, the focus on DEI really isn't there anymore. And when you raise that mm -hmm, mm -hmm. earlier about um, companies who are doing well already and the data, I, I, I can't tell you how many times over the last 15 years that I've said, yes. We want to bring data into the conversation, but if you're talking to a behemoth that has um, inequitable practices and less diversity inside an organization, it's really hard to sell that to them. It's hard totally. to sell it. It's hard to sell that they need to be uh, more competitive, that they actually will do better as an organization when they're actually sitting back behind closed doors and saying, we're doing what well. We are. Exactly. We really need to have to focus. We don't have to focus on that. And, and that, that gets me back to the mindset, right? So let's, let's, let's just mm -hmm. shift a bit from, you know, kind of the collective uh, uh, understanding and, and, and agreement that we have around things that need to be done in terms of the social impact of this work, right? But let's talk about the challenges um, inside organizations, the mindset of the individuals, the decision makers, those folks who, who are really deciding, um, you know, what they're going to implement, what they're in, uh, intention is going to be within the organization. And, and as uh, I date myself again, you know, having been in this work for over 35 years, um, I've seen the ebb and flow in, cor in corporate, right? I've been a part of that and often in the fetal position around it. Um, so when we, we've we seen the backlash against the progressive movements, right? And we continue to see that. Um, what advice do you give to the corporate side of DEI practitioners that to kind of weather that storm of resistance and and um, you know I have some thoughts around this as well and obviously having been the the found being the founder of Diversity Waymaker there's a specific thing that we need to address around that but I want to hear mm -hmm. your thoughts about that how can you uh, provide some information for those DEI practitioners out there wondering. Great question. And I'd love to hear your reflections as well. So I think um, back to the, the first reflection around, I think the narrative is super important, right? So why does this matter? Like, what's your pitch? Why does this matter? Yeah. What tangible evidence will folks see um, to change? Or, or like, what is the rationale for uh, whether you want to implement a new program, you want to change your hiring practices? Um, I think being like super clear on the, the narrative is really important. And to your point, like, we can, there are lots of different narratives and some, you know, everybody knows their company's best. Some will land with some and some won't land with others, right? So there are companies who really want to be good corporate citizens in communities, right? There are certain messages that'll work well there. There are others who are um, quite frankly, like, uh, they're like, what can we do to not be on the radar of regulators, right? So that's another message. Yeah. Um, um, there are others that, you know, like talking about diverse perspectives as you're developing products that are going to serve a diverse population. Sometimes that resonates more. So I think again, like figuring out what your, what your pitch is, why this matters is super important. Um, and I'd be remiss to not say like, this is what we've seen over our span. And I know you've seen this Yolanda for an even longer time than I have, but 
Um, I think it's super critical that um, folks inside doing the corp doing corporate DEI work are also kind of um, in collaboration um, with the folks on the outside, right? So I think there's like a, a push from both sides that's needed because on the one hand, as I said before, if there's no external accountability mechanism, it's going to be very hard um, to push to push things internally. So I think there's a lot more that we could do to like collaborate across, um, you know, external groups and, and internal corporate TEI practitioners. I agree. I think that there's an ecosystem that we create, right? Uh, the collective of, of community and outside and, and also inside and ensuring that there's a common language and a common understanding of what does that actually look like to be effective, right? And so, um, yes, in my point of view on this particular, this particular subject is really around, uh, you know, the reason why I created Diversity Waymaker was because I think we spend a lot of time and have spent over years, probably since Workforce, two, Workforce 2000, about building competencies for, for leaders that are um, servant leadership and leading magnificently and all these things that we hold them accountable for being through our performance um, evaluation systems and, and it's tied to their money and bonus, but, but we have not ask them to embody and master um, those same competencies as a leader through the lens of equity um, and through the lens of racial equity. And it's super important that there's a very explicit set of values and skills that, that one must embody to be able to actually move and be a catalyst for this work. Mm -hmm. uh, organizations committing to that, startup organizations committing to mastering those competencies the same way they master any other leadership competency, and then having that being embedded in their performance management systems and tied to things like bonus and, and incentive is essential. It's critical to, mm -hmm. to that. Not only is, is the competency aspect very critical, I want to hear your point of view on this, but it's also um, being brave enough inside environments, and, and we use the term idiosyncratic, which is kind of the competency by which all other competencies are, are uh, you know, kind of surrounded and being idiosyncratic and, and really saying that you cannot um, truly advocate for, advocate for uh, diverse and equitable practices or equitable and inclusive practices if you are not able to come up against resistance and overcome it. If you are not able to uh, have polarized, um, you know, uh, conversations and polarized um, topics, right? If if your body is weary from fighting the status quo with inside organizations and collectively working on all of those things together to make you a greater voice when you say we want to be seen and heard in the room. Sure, you want to be seen mm -hmm. and heard in the room, but you also want to make sure that you are effective at your negotiation. And you can only do that by embodying a skill set that allows you to do that. Why do we think that, you know, lobbyists are good at what they do? Why are politicians good at what they do? It's because they've embodied this, a very explicit skill. And, and so I want to hear your point of view on that from a leadership perspective, you know, what you think is, is essential for leaders in leading this work and really being able to advocate for it. Absolutely. So actually, as you were talking, I was reminded of um, some previous work that we did in the, in the tech workforce uh, space, um, which was working working with more junior DEI leaders. And so as they were entering into these roles, and some of them had no background or training in diversity at all, but had the passion, right? And so how do you take um, a young potential leader and develop those, those competencies, yeah. as you mentioned? And we have like a I could go down a laundry list of things that we learned from those experiences, but I think there, there's some core things that are very similar that mirror similar things to what you said, which is um, mindset is critical, arming yourself with the data and arming yourself with a like data strategy, like very clear. Um, and uh, let's see what, like, what might be a third? Um, yeah, I think the, the folks that we've seen be highly successful have had um, have taken on a learning mindset, right? Like what else do I need to learn? It has to be a constant learning mindset. It's not, you can't, you can't take a course on DEI and be like a DEI practitioner, right? It's like a constant learning, uh, cycle. Uh, yeah. learning cycle. Um, so I think that is, has been super critical. And then this is not exactly an answer to your question, but as I'm thinking about those folks, like I literally have faces in mind of people that have that have come through the programs that have worked at um, various, like, you know, from large to, to mid-sized tech companies 
is there is a structural problem uh, with DEI practitioners being able to be effective inside of corporate um, America. And I think we have to kind of name that too. And so that gets us back to, okay, well, what are accountability mechanisms or how do we build these leadership capacities in the act, the leaders in the C-suite? How do we ensure that diversity and inclusion is actually incorporated in their mindsets as well? And we struggle, you know, with resources, dollars, et cetera. We're the, you know, kind of the first uh, Absolutely. To go, right? And 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 say, oh, we're not going to do that this year because we have other stuff that that is prioritized. And so we steadily see the shrinking uh, resources and we find ourselves running around the organizations with 10 cups, you know, asking people to, to contribute money that they quite frankly have not um, put aside in the budgets. So mm-hmm. that, I think that's big. And, and, and truly being mindful around the fact that you know, what kind of competency are you putting in the position of a DE&I practitioner, right? It's somebody right. in fashion, but, but what is the true qualifying standard of that individual? We'd love to see diversity waymakers uh, become the thing, right? That, that that's a set of core mm-hmm. competency that everyone must possess. Um, and, and I think it's important for organizations to view and see it that way. There is a mindset inside organizations where, they feel like, oh, we'll get this person. We won't pay them. They'll do it for free. We won't pay them extra, right? They're doing Mm -hmm. right alongside their other job and we'll, they have passion about it. So we're going to have them do it and it saves us money. Uh, So you're right. It is about, you know, kind of being reversing that mindset of what's really required of a DEI practitioner and also so that they stay as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I want to quickly go to questions, if there are any questions out there that we can pose to Dr. Scott or myself. We can just keep this conversation going, Yolanda. I love it. (laughs) How how challenging it is, right? Exactly. (laughs) Coming up, nothing coming up. So, um, I was at, I sat on the board of the Biennial of the Americas, and a few years back, we had um, a, a, a delegation that went to um, Toronto and Montreal uh, to, to have some conversations about economy, conversations about tech, conversations about cultural art, all those kinds of things that the, the Biennial really focuses on. And um, one of the presentations that was done was on AI. Right. And the very, uh, and this was probably, oh, I think it was 2018, mm. uh, maybe 2017. And even then, um, the conversations around fear of regulation of AI was coming up and saying, and, and the topic was, you've got individuals that are teaching the machines, right, that are actually coding and doing things inside the machine. So how do you how do you prevent inequity or um, bigotry or anything like that from entering into that process if you don't regulate it, right? Mm-hmm. Are we trying to avoid regulation? Are we trying to establish a set of guidelines that, you know, all tech, uh, you know, software developers, et cetera, must follow and in integrity, almost like the code of, what is it? The code of ethics for um, uh, for law and for, and for medicine, right? So, what which way in your advocacy and your advocacy and, and and the the policy advocacy do you see probably best addressing that issue it's a it's a great question and hopefully i don't go too far down a rabbit hole because i could spend like an hour I talking know, about so that. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's it is super super important so um two things so one from in my opinion we've never seen an as um, significant an appetite for regulation as we are now, right? I feel like finally people are like, wait a second, this is completely out of control. Um, we didn't regulate social media companies at all. Um, we don't, we were very poor on data privacy regulation. Um, and so I think, I think, again, my opinion, I, I feel like collectively we understand we need to regulate, um, AI in some way. Then that gets into the conversation about, well, how do we regulate it? What what are we regulating? What are the best mechanisms for regulation? Um, and I think the, the most recent executive order, I think, did a pretty good job of like laying out a bunch of the categories that we should be considering. But quite honestly, like this is very, um, this is like nascent uh, right. space, right? We're still figuring out 
Um, and we've had great conversations with some of the uh, the the leaders in the space who have you know d- done the groundbreaking work on algorithmic bias, for example. And yeah. even among that group, there's still differences in opinion on how best to regulate uh, the technology. But I think most simply, um, the things that keep us up at night are um, who's creating the technology, right? So who, what data sets are we using? And if we're not regulating any of these things, right? Who the data sets have are inherently biased. But we need to learn about the bias in those data sets and better understand them to be able to effectively regulate. Um, and then there's the like the do no harm principles, like you mentioned, right? So what does that actually mean? Like, are we actually assessing whether harm has been done? And that's a, that's a space I'm very interested in. I'm super interested in it. I, I'm trying to to I, I guess it's that part of my techie mind that 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 when we also think about the use of AI for you know, some of the things that we're doing in innovation and DE&I and, and how why, might we contribute, you know, to that. I think it's it, it's on the top of my mind. Um, and I think it's actually going to be required, you know, absolutely right, for sure. Yeah. Um, and that's yeah. What actually our founder, um, Mitch Kapoor, he's, he um, is a big proponent on we need guardrails, but that let's also think about the potential like good that, you know, in all of our spaces, right? So it can't just be a select group of um, of companies that are really thinking deeply about uh, the new frontier on AI, but how do all of us think about AI, how it can help to advance our work is like, and so moving, and, and he's very good at pushing us too. Like we can't just focus on the harms and harm mitigation and regulation, right, but like right. also say like, what are some positive right. uses of this amazing, powerful new technology or else we'll also be left behind, right? That's true. And and we do have to look at the technology as this is huge advancements. Um, it's something that has the potential of doing some pretty significant significant things, both for race, race equity and just in general, right, across tech. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we know that it's a beautiful thing, but just like anything beautiful, we have to assess, is there a, a thorn somewhere? And there certainly is. So absolutely. Absolutely. Um we don't have uh, any questions coming up right now. So we'll take the opportunity in the next couple minutes to, to give us any closing remarks, any um, nuggets of, of, of insight, of hope. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'd love well, to hear from you on that. <laughs> wonderful. Happy to do it. And, and would love yours too. Um, no, in, in um, thinking about this presentation and this conversation, I was actually really thinking like the the main thing that I wanted to leave folks with was a sense of optimism, right? Like let's not let's not feel too overwhelmed. It is overwhelming. There's a lot happening. Um, and even, you know, an example of like the fearless fund lawsuit, like that felt very demoralizing to a lot of people and understandably so. Um, you know, a group that's extremely marginalized in the space, and you have an organization trying to work to help support them that's then having to go through all these. The, these lawsuits and challenges, but I think if we can, um, you know, like looking at the bigger picture, like this too shall pass. That's my hope. Like this too shall pass. There could be no, none of us predicted George Floyd or 2020 or $300 billion in racial equity commitments. Bye. Um, so just want to thank and appreciate everyone for the, the really often tireless work that you're doing around diversity and inclusion. And it's extremely important. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we envision a future where this will be a core competency that everyone needs to have um, uh, expertise around diversity and inclusion. And maybe it's not even called diversity and inclusion anymore. Maybe that's just leadership competency, right? Just leadership competency. Um, we often hear people say, uh, we want to get to a place where we don't have um, any, uh, where there's no no emphasis on DE and I, right? That, that there's exactly. so much equality. And I say that, that that's a good thing. And, and in order to get there, there has to actually be equity across the board, right? I mean, exactly. That, and, Till there is a in, uh, until we remove the imbalance of of kind of the power construct, right? That is disproportionately where BIPOC is disproportionately impacted. Um, we're always going to have this conversation. Exactly, it's going to look different. Right? Exactly. Oh, and there's one more thing that I forgot to mention. It was um another a study most recently from because you know we 
we hear the loudest voices and we have to pay attention to the loudest voices, which are literally like the folks who are filing lawsuits against companies and organizations. So we have to pay attention to that and fight on that front. But also there was a a study from, um, or a poll from the Black Economic Alliance that showed that bipartisan support for, yes, corporate America should reflect America. Like people generally support this concept of diversity. So like, I think that's a hopeful place to land to that. I think it's true. And I think that there, that again, the imbalance of, of the power construct is this, is there's a smaller group with a lot of power and a lot of voice. And that's what we have to kind of combat. You're so amazing. I'm so happy that you came and spent this time and that we were able to have this conversation. Um, we look forward to, to more conversations. I'm sure that we, we're going to invite you to, to the summit uh, that we'll be doing this year and, and, and see if we can't get you to speak there as well. But just super, super, super thrilled to have this conversation with you. Um, not only just this uh, kind of interaction and, and minds going back and forth on this very deep subject, but just as a friend and a colleague, I thank you so much, Allison, for being here. Thank you. She's on mute. Sorry, I was saying thank you so much for for the invitation. Honestly, like for me, it was a wonderful um, experience and time for me to even reflect on our work, right? And so um, I just really appreciate the the opportunity to share with you and to have this conversation, Yolanda, with you has been wonderful as well. Um, and I appreciate everyone for the, joining us. Yeah, and I'm gonna see you. I'll see you at all the tech events and all that other. Exactly. Stuff. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Maylene, thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Yolanda and Allison. It's such an enlightening, authentic conversation. So, and, and obviously, I took a lot of actionable steps about you know diversifying the tech workforce considerations, uh, what we must be willing to um, do, and you know advance to make sure that we are working towards equity, especially in the face of resistance. Also, the connections of, you know, anchoring solutions and data so that we can ensure that we're addressing the root causes of inequities. I just wanted to um, just point out that we have the link to the survey, uh, the post-event survey there. And before I invite Yolanda to share the final words uh, for our audience, I just want to also share that uh, it was great, Yolanda, to hear more about the Diversity Waymaker Framework as you share the importance of leadership coaching to embody equity-focused competencies. I just want to note that that we'll have more opportunity to share about that uh, at the next event um, coming up on December 7th. And for the audience, because you attended today, you will get an invitation for that next offering. Uh, But please don't forget to respond to the post-event survey because that helps us um, make improvements to future uh, offerings as well. And so Yolanda, if you have any last, um, you know, final comments. My final comments are always stay vigilant. Um, stay committed to this work, stay committed to yourself in, in learning and becoming enlightened. There isn't one thing um, that we do that requires more of us than love and equity. So let's make sure that we're moving forward and not going backwards. And when we're confused and upset and feel um, disillusioned by some things, let's educate ourselves in the right spaces and really understand what's required of us and of of everyone else around us. So thank you for joining today. Peace Reflections, have an awesome rest of the week. Be well. Thank you all so much.